This is a Ross Safari Zoo News special report. Veterinarians in crisis. What are we to do? And here is your host helping to explain it all, John Rossi. Hello, hello, hello. I am releasing this episode on Saturday, June 18th, which is an important day as it is Veterinary Appreciation Day. And I'm here to share with you some information about the veterinary field and why these people are so worthy of appreciation. But here's the thing. As my transatlantic host friend, which is definitely not just me holding my nose, uh, mentioned, uh, it's time to buckle in because this is not going to be the happy stuff. Instead, I want to talk to you about some of the realities facing vets, vet techs, vet tech assistants, and others in the field today. For starters, did you know that there is a massive shortage of veterinarians, techs, and tech assistants in the field right now? Massive. The problem is exacerbated by the fact that during the COVID pandemic, people adopted and purchased pets at an incredible rate. One in five homes in the United States added at least one new pet during the lockdown, and those pets all need veterinary care, or, you know, at least they should be getting it. Um, There were actually many news stories during that time about shelters being completely empty for the first time ever, something that, you know, was great news, but that does mean that a lot of new pets need doctors. The industry is really struggling to keep up with demand right now, and the vets are being faced with a lot of tough decisions, including whether to see as many patients as possible or provide the best care possible, a decision that is both challenging and, frankly, kind of unfair to the vets. Um, and, and that's just one example of why life as a vet can be rather challenging. Did you know that, according to a CDC report from 2018, one in six vets will die by suicide, and that, according to a 2021 study by the American Medical Association, the veterinarian suicide rate is 2.6 times the national average? This has led to the creation of the Not One More Vet movement, which you can learn more about at nomv.org. Also, if you are a vet and you happen to be listening to this or you know a vet who is struggling, please send them to that website as it has a lot of great resources for people in the field that are struggling. But yeah, this is a a real problem, y'all. I mean, think about it. For a person to become a veterinarian, they have to love animals. And then they end up working with sick and dying animals every single day. Now, we all know that vets at zoos are the ones to make the call to humanely euthanize the animals they love. But even non-zoo vets have to make that call every single day. And then those vets have to communicate that to the animal care team, in the case of a zoo, or to the pet owners. And watch them come to terms with the fact they are going to lose a loved one. Now, there is one positive here, which is that most vets I know truly believe that euthanasia is a good thing. I've, I've said it on the podcast before, and I'll say it again, but Rasafari is wildly pro-euthanasia because it truly means giving a dignified death to an animal and ending its suffering in a humane way. That being said... Watching something you love die, day in and day out, cannot be easy to process. And on top of that, vets are watching families or care teams say goodbye to beloved animals, or even worse, decide they can't stay with their animal and say goodbye, so that the vet may be the last human that animal sees— and, and that's got to take a toll on even the strongest person, r- regardless of how much they believe that euthanasia was the right call in that situation. And honestly, sometimes that decision can get really tricky. See, something that people in the vet field constantly hear complaints about is the price of practice and the practice of surrendering pets to save their lives if an owner can't pay. 
Now we're going to talk about this and we're going to look at an example that uh, has kind of blown up recently. So stay with me on this one. Y'all, medical care is expensive. In America, we just kind of accept that fact. Um, Those of you who are regular listeners know that I was in the hospital a few months back. To date, that medical care without insurance would have cost me $48,447.29. Even with my insurance, my bills are costing me over $5,000. And um, I used the phrase to date because I legitimately have no idea if more bills are coming. In the human healthcare system, they don't tell you what things cost. I remember the cardiologist coming into my room and saying, hey, you might be having a heart attack. We need to do a heart catheterization. Sign here. And I did because a doctor told me to and said I might be having a heart attack, which I would later find out both that I was not having and that the lead cardiologist was fairly certain that I wasn't having. That procedure cost $21,931. And no one told me that. Almost 22 grand to make sure something the doctor was pretty damn sure wasn't happening was not happening. Oh, and uh, I was in the recovery room for less than an hour after that. And uh, the cost for my time in the recovery room, where I sat by myself and nobody was actively observing me or working on me and I got no medical care, $880. Oh, and speaking of rooms, I was in the hospital for three nights And the daily room charge was between $2,208 and $2,928. In total, my three-night stay just for the room and board cost $8,064 for three nights of just the room and board. We're not talking medical care. We're not talking drugs. That is beyond ridiculous. Now, I tell you all of that, and I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, yeah, but that's human medicine. Plus, you have insurance, so it only costs you five grand. Well, okay, first of all, only five grand, really? To, like, live and be healthy? But this is not a podcast about universal health care, and so we're going to move on. Um, and yeah, that, that is true. It, it, you know, it costs me around five grand, and it is human medicine. But There is pet insurance for that very same reason, yet it seems like a heck of a lot of people opt to not get pet insurance. See, here's the thing, though. Medical care is expensive for human and non-human animals. Medical doctors and veterinarians get the same amount of training. Many vets then go on to work wildly underpaid internships, externships, and residencies. But for some reason, the general public seems to have a problem with them wanting to make the same salaries for their work as medical doctors. And um, by the way, they don't. In fact, according to U.S. News, the average veterinary salary in the United States is $108,350 a year, while the average physician salary is $218,850 a year, more than double. But it's also not the salary of the vet or the tech or whoever in question that is affecting the costs you face when Fido swallows a sock. The drug companies and the medical tech companies don't decide that because they are making something for an animal, it should be cheaper. Oh, this CT scanner and MRI machine are going to a vet's office? Let's only charge them half, is a sentence that has never been uttered. And many of the drugs that are used in animal medicine are made by the same drug companies that make human drugs, and we all know what they charge. One of the drugs I was prescribed upon discharge from the hospital was $600 for a one-month supply, and my insurance does not cover said drug. Luckily, I was able to find this cool online discount program and ended up getting it at a much better cost. But the point is, it was a $600 drug, and I cannot even believe that I can say that phrase. 
And again, I need to point out that if your vet needed to prescribe that medicine, it would still be a $600 drug. In fact, when it comes to exotic animals, there often aren't large enough populations of them in the country for drug companies to work on actually finding specific drugs for them. It wouldn't be profitable enough to even figure out dosages of their current human or animal drugs for those exotics. So it's left to vets to do research on what is out there and hope and pray that they can figure out how to, for lack of a better word, um, translate the drug to the exotic animal? Some dog medicines, cat medicines, horse medicines, those, those exist. They have specific drugs for some of those animals because they are common enough for drug companies to profit from them. That, that's why. But you can't really go out and find a, say, chameleon-based medicine for when your chameleon gets sick. At best, there might be some studies of a common medicine used by humans and other animals that were done on some turtles once, and then it's up to the vet to figure out how similar the dosage should be and if it might work with the physiology of a chameleon based on a decades-old test on a turtle. And then, if they are able to figure it out, the drug is still going to cost an arm and a leg because it's a damn drug and this is America and we have pharma bros, y'all. Let's say you're a human, and I assume that you are based on the fact that you're, you know, listening to my podcast right now, uh, and you get cancer and need chemotherapy. There are seven types of drugs commonly used in human chemotherapy. Alkylating agents, nitrosaurias, Antimetabolites, plant alkaloids, anti tumor antibiotics, hormonal agents, and biological response modifiers. Now, if your cat gets cancer and needs chemotherapy, the six types of drugs commonly used in their treatments will be alkylating agents, nitrosaurias, antimetabolites, anti tumor antibiotics, hormonal agents, and biological response modifiers. Noticing a theme here? Now, if you're a human, there's a good chance that you'll get those drugs from a company like Merck Pharmaceuticals. And if you're a cat, yep, Merck makes your drugs as well. So while the dosage will probably be smaller unless you're a really tiny human or a really big cat, you're looking at the same drugs at the same cost. And how do medical doctors find out if a human has cancer? It's a mixture of a uh, physical exam, laboratory testing, imaging tests like CT scans, MRI, PET scans, ultrasounds, and x-rays. Then, if they find something, they do a biopsy. And that is exactly how a cat gets diagnosed with cancer, too. Same drugs, same tests, same equipment, same type of education, thus you end up with the same cost. Or, you know, at least darn close. So again. Reminder, go get pet insurance unless you can just afford to drop all that money. Now, that does lead to an interesting difference between human and veterinary medicine, which is the discussion of the costs with the owner. In human medicine, this almost never happens, like in the case of my $20,000 heart catheterization. Vets, on the other hand, almost always discuss the cost of the procedure with the owner. Now, this is great news for owners that, you know, don't want to go bankrupt, and especially ones that don't have pet insurance, but it also puts a lot of pressure on vets. They have to talk directly to concerned owners about their financial decisions, and often they get yelled at or even threatened because these things cost what they cost. These are horrible situations for the owner and for the vet especially when owners can't afford expensive treatments and the animals will have a low quality of life without treatment, so the decision has to be made to euthanize the animal or to surrender it. And that leads to a new trend that veterinarians seem to be facing more frequently, which is social media campaigns against vets that take in surrendered animals and save their lives. Uh, there's actually a vet hospital in Maine that is going through this right now, and rather than kind of extemporaneously speak on their story, I'm just going to read their release about it to you. Uh, this is a statement from Maine Veterinary Medical Center, and even though it's super long, I'm going to read it all because I was just going to have to explain all this stuff in my episode anyway. But I am going to read it slightly out of order, which uh, I'll explain when I get there. So, okay, 
Here is the statement. On May 26th, the pet owner brought her four-month-old purebred German Shepherd puppy, Jax, to our hospital. The puppy was in distress and, based on our initial examination, was shown to have an infection, fever, and was experiencing pain. Based on the infection, it was clear the dog had been suffering for at least 24 to 48 hours prior to our seeing him. Per protocol, Jax was screened for parvovirus, which was negative. The pet owner assured us that while Jax had had his rabies and distemper shots earlier in the week, he had not gotten into anything or eaten anything he shouldn't have. She agreed to leave Jax at the hospital overnight for further tests and observation. Based on the owner's information, an initial cost estimate of $2,630.55 to $3,330.26 was given to the owner. The following morning, it was clear Jax was experiencing even greater abdominal pain, so at 9 a.m., an ultrasound was performed. These are the findings from that test. Based on the ultrasound, a presumptive skewer, linear object, is penetrating from the duodenum, remember guys, I'm a drummer, the first part of the small intestine, through liver and entering the chest. There is free fluid within the chest and abdomen due to these ruptures slash penetrations. Concern for pyothorax, infection slash pus, in the chest and free abdominal fluid consistent with leaking intestinal contents and concern for septic abdomen. This is a significant injury that requires emergency surgery. Surgery plan is to remove the skewer, close the hole slash rupture in small intestine, duodenum, ensure the liver does not have significant penetration, bleeding, or complication. Further intervention to close the diaphragm where the skewer is penetrating to prevent further complication and normal breathing. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. The chest will be lavaged, flushed out, and chest tubes placed to get the secondary infection under control. Chest tubes may be in for one to three days, depending on fluid production slash infection control, etc., Jax will also have an abdominal drain to help control infection in his abdomen and to ensure he is healing well. Jax is persistently tachycardic, high heart rate, and is visibly in pain despite being injected with pain medications. It's hard to know how long since this was ingested, however, penetrated through small intestinal tract presumptively when he started feeling ill roughly 24 to 48 hours prior to presentation. Further possible penetration and additional organ injury, abdominal as well as thoracic organs, including heart, pericardium, major blood vessels and lungs, and develop systemic sepsis likely if we wait much longer. At 9.30 a.m., the results of the ultrasound and the fact that this was now an emergency were communicated to the pet owner via telephone. A medical plan for Jax's needed surgery and continued care was discussed, as was the cost of $9,585.57 to $10,086.41, including current balance for Jax's overnight medications and care. The doctor discussed the credit options offered by the hospital, which are care credit, applying for Wells Fargo credit, or scratch pay. The hospital also accepts all major credit cards and pet insurance plans. The owner said she'd speak with her fiancé and call back. After 90 minutes, the owner had not called back, so she was contacted by the hospital and told that a 50% deposit would allow the doctor to begin the surgery. 
The owner said she was applying for a bank loan, which she was assured she would get so we could go ahead with the surgery. The doctor explained, once again, that the surgery would not go forward without a deposit. The owner asked to know the exact cost. The doctor explained that until we knew the full extent of Jax's internal injuries or any possible complications, that we couldn't predict that. Owner said to continue to monitor Jax until she heard from the bank. At 1.30 p.m., the hospital contacted the owner again, asking for an update. The owner said she still hadn't heard from the bank, but that she essentially has the loan and would know by 3 p.m. The doctor again discussed credit care to at least get a deposit so the surgery could begin. The doctor advised the owner that we wanted to begin Jax's care to help avoid complications and emergency fees. The owner replied that she understood but wanted to get the bank loan and would know by 3 p.m. By 4 p.m., with no word from the owner, the hospital called the owner, who reported she had been declined for the loan by the bank. The owner told the doctor, at this point, I'm prepared to say goodbye because you guys don't have payment plans and I have no way of paying. The doctor then raised the possibility of, rather than euthanizing Jax, to instead surrender him to another owner who would be able to pay for the surgery and care for Jax. The owner understandably distraught, told the doctor, quote, if you guys can give him a life and it's not with me, then that's fine. While surrendering a pet is a last resort, our priority is always saving the animal. It is unfortunate and heartbreaking for this pet owner that she did not have the means to cover this emergency. It is, however, a credit to our dedicated staff that another option to save the puppy was explored. The pet owner signed a legal document surrendering ownership. That document also ensures the privacy of the new owner, and based on the social media vitriol that has run wild since the news story aired, we're thankful for that. Jax had the surgery and is recovering well. We have photos. He is with his new owner and we hope will live a long and happy life. Reports that Jax's original owner finally raised all the money and paid us $10,000 but we wouldn't give the puppy back are untrue. She paid the hospital for Jax's initial medications and tests. She did open a GoFundMe account, but it was closed after she surrendered her puppy, raising only $100. Okay, so let's break down that part and then we'll get back to the beginning and the end, which address something else. Uh, Some people will say that the vets should just do the work for free, but as I mentioned above, even if they were willing to waive their personal fee, the cost of the drugs and the equipment and the additional staff needed at the hospital and even things like, you know, the mortgage or rent on the building and like paying for electricity and stuff, all that stuff would still add up to a huge price to take care of Jax. And it's easy to say that a vet can just waive a fee once, but That's not how it would work. Owners would start to expect that regularly. Not only would the vets not be able to make a living, but they wouldn't be able to afford their staffs, their practices. And remember, these are places that are already wildly understaffed at this time. It's easy to hear that story and say they should have just waived the fee for Jax. But y'all, there is always another Jax in the box. Sorry, had to get at least a little of the usual Rasafari humor in here. Um, But yeah, as the statement mentioned, uh, there are options such as care credit, specific funding options that are available to a lot of people, even those who may not have the best credit scores, uh, if you're in a position to incur debt to help your pet. And uh, again, a lot of this problem can be solved with pet insurance. And now let me read you the beginning and end of that statement, which address a different part of this. It says, Earlier this week, we were contacted by a reporter from a local television station seeking a comment about a case we handled in May that resulted in a pet owner surrendering her pet to save its life. While the veterinary medical profession is not subject to the same HIPAA-type privacy laws as the human medical profession, we have always behaved as if we were. Our initial inclination was to comment, but decided against it because we knew that the pet owner involved had been through a traumatic experience, we wanted to honor her privacy, and we assumed the story would be matter of fact. We were naive. We had no idea the story would so malign not only our hospital and our caring doctors and staff, but, by extension, our profession. 
In this era of viral, quote, news and sensational journalism, our staff are now faced with a social media maelstrom that includes hourly threats to burn down the hospital and to kill our staff and their families. We've had to have police guarding the hospital around the clock. Our phone lines have been deliberately jammed so that real emergency calls cannot get through. The language that has been used against our staff is vile and vulgar. The hate that has been unleashed due to this shoddy news story and the concomitant lies spread through social media are shocking. Especially because the news story was inaccurate, and we have the documentation to prove it. The reporter relied solely on the word of a pet owner. While it's true we elected not to comment, the reporter could have asked for documentation from the pet owner or third-party corroboration to ensure that what she reported was true, but she did not, and we have paid the price. We realize now we have to break our silence. And at that point, they share all of the stuff that uh, I I read earlier. And then at the end, they say, a final note. While we have been vilified by hundreds of people, we have every email and every voicemail as proof. We also have been gratified to receive the unconditional support of the veterinary medicine community. The outpouring of empathy from our fellow doctors and technicians— and our many pet families, have helped us get through what has been a demoralizing episode. This situation was unique to our practice, but it is not unique to the profession. Veterinary doctors are victims of threats and violence to such an extent that it is a national crisis. The organization Not One More Vet exists to help prevent suicide and to aid members of our profession who are in crisis. We love our doctors, our staff, our profession, and our loving clients. We speak and work for animals who can't speak, who can't tell us where they hurt or how much pain they feel. That's our job, and we do it because we love it. Please be kind. It's good advice, y'all. Be kind. You know, while the example I just read is an extreme one of the online vitriol that vets can face, the truth is it is hard to find a veterinary hospital, or a human one for that matter, that has, like, great online reviews. Why? Because most satisfied customers don't take to the internet to talk about how great their mammogram was or whatever. Nope, it's the sad, frustrated people who use Facebook, Instagram, and Yelp to vent their frustrations without having to prove that something wrong actually happened. I have looked at the Facebook pages and reviews of more than a few vet hospitals, and along with almost universal low-star ratings, the reviews are beyond disturbing. Well-respected institutions have review after review that says the doctors there don't care about patients, that they kill animals, that they only care about getting rich, and on and on and on. And that is simply not the case. Most of you listening to this probably know that Zoe, my fiancé, is a veterinarian. Because of that, I'm not only acutely aware of the time and effort she gives to every patient and the tears she sheds over the ones that don't work out, but I'm also aware that for many of her classmates who have gone on to become vets, the same thing is true. I get to experience their stories firsthand, and I promise you, They and the vast majority of veterinarians, vet techs, vet tech assistants, and even the people who work at the front desk of vet hospitals and such really do care about your pets and want the best for them. These people provide state-of-the-art medical care, pouring their hearts and souls into every animal that comes through the door. And they're humans. They read the negative comments. They remember the red faces screaming at them or the crying families saying goodbye to their beloved pets. And then they also have to go home and face their own lives, their own pressures, their own issues, and occasionally their annoying fiancé who wants to talk about musical spoons and Marvel movies for hours on end. It's a tough life. But seriously, they're real humans. Good people with huge hearts that love animals yet have to say goodbye to them every day. On this Veterinary Appreciation Day, make sure you appreciate the hell out of the vets in your life. 
And the next time you're at a veterinary office and you encounter a difficult circumstance, don't take it out on the vet. They are sad or frustrated about what they are telling you, just like you're sad or frustrated at the news. And please, please consider whether you are able to financially support a pet before getting it. Get yourself pet insurance and understand that at the end of the day, if an emergency happens and you're not able to take on the financial burden, that's on you, not on the person who is just trying to do their best to save an animal's life. Seems kind of weird to end such a deep, dark story by saying something as frivolous as, um... Happy Veterinary Appreciation Day, but uh, to, to all of my vets that are listening, truly, I hope it's a happy day. I really do, and I love you, and I appreciate everything that you are doing for your patients who can't speak, and uh, I just appreciate the hell out of you. Steiderk. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Vesley Gross. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.